God puts us in nations, in places, not by mistake, but to do a job. What if we opened our eyes to the needs of our colleagues, of our leaders, of our subordinates, and we were a priest on their behalf? Welcome to the Repurposing Business Podcast. My name is Brett Johnson. And I'm Len Johnson. And we're going to be talking about how to get our business into God's business. Our subtext is Let My Business Go, and we'll have guests from around the world. So thank you for joining us this week and every week on the Repurposing Business Podcast. Well, welcome to the Repurposing Business Podcast. I'm here with Henry Kestner. And yes, you might be confused because it sounds a bit like Henry Kissinger. And the only difference between the two, I think, Henry, is that you are busier than Kissinger ever was busy, I think. And uh, <laughs> he's got so much of a cooler accent, too. Yeah, he's, he's got that deep, that deep voice. But you know what's happening, of course, is that you and I are both dating ourselves a bit. <laughs> There's a good chance that the younger crowd doesn't have any idea who we're talking about. They're busy Googling him right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact is that, uh, Henry, you've got your finger in a lot of pies. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, as founding partner, I guess, and uh, running Sovereign's Capital, and then many other things, faith-driven investor, faith-driven entrepreneur. I've had the privilege as I've been out in my yard over here listening to podcast after podcast of your interviews, which has been fantastic. But take us back a bit. I'd love to get your perspectives broadly a little later on what's happening in the investing world. But before we go there, if you could tell us a bit about your background, that would be fantastic. No, I'm happy to. And you need to, as you see me joining on, you need to, to speed me up at, at times because um, uh, I could go on, but I'll try not to. So I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm 51 now. So that was 51 years ago. And then I went uh, to school at the University of Delaware, having grown up in Baltimore. And I discovered my first love there. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a girl. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the fact that I could make a t-shirt for $5 and sell it for 10 <laughs> And it just was, oh, it was so much fun. Yeah. Uh, by the time I got out of college, we had sales teams of one form or fashion at 50 different schools uh, up and down the East Coast and far west is Wyoming. We started a, a business called College Design Group, Brett, that made, if you believe it, sounds really strange, but we made tie-dyed boxer shorts. What? And back then, boxer shorts were worn by women as cover-ups for their bathing suits. Okay. And we sold them uh, 125 stores in, in places like Urban Outfitters. Urban Outfitters carried college design group tie-dye boxer shorts. Um, I ended up having some trademark, trademark infringement problems from the t-shirt side of the business. Yeah. And so my dad said, listen, pal, you can plead naivete when you're 20, but the, by the time you're 21, you've got to have found a real job. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay. And uh, that kind of legal scare had scared me. Mm. So I had recently seen the movie Wall Street, the original movie Wall Street. Yeah. And um, there's this guy, this character in there, Bud Fox. He had two phones up and he was dating Daryl Hannah and his life seemed to be set to a soundtrack by Frank Sinatra and the Talking Heads. And I'm like, I want to be Bud Fox. And really, Brett, that's the first, that's a, really the first sign that your life is headed in the wrong direction when Charlie Sheen is your first role model. Right. Because Charlie Sheen was the, the actor who played this guy. Yeah. And so I went and worked on Wall Street for six years and, and gosh, it's so cliche, but I, I tried to find happiness and joy in all the things that I thought would deliver it. Mm. And of course, didn't find it. It's the proverbial God-shaped hole. Mm. Um, but along the way, I didn't meet a, just a wonderful, wonderful woman and got engaged to her. And then I uh, had never lost my, my memory of what it felt like to be fully alive as an entrepreneur. So we moved from uh, New York City to North Carolina to set up a financial derivatives broking shop. Yeah. And max out all my credit cards to do it. And along the way, um, uh, stepped into a church. We stepped into a church because Kimberly and I had both grown up in a liberal Christian tradition, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm over it, it, saying a little bit here, but it's kind of like a moral social country club, but it never heard the gospel. Yeah. And so uh, we walked into this Presbyterian church, which we thought was safe. We both grew up in a liberal Presbyterian church. And, yeah. but in this one, the pastor seemed to be, uh, well, it was preaching from the Bible as if he really believed it was true. Yeah. And that threw us for a complete loop. Mm. And so that began this faith journey, um, a really a journey of discovery. Well, for the first year, um, we wouldn't even take communion, but we're fascinated by this. And it occurred to me that I could get up to heaven, Brett, and 
St. Peter's there for the entrance interview. And he's like, okay, Kastner, while you were on earth, you read like a thousand books, but you never cracked the cover of the best selling book of all time. I can't lay in. Yeah. I thought, gosh, it, it can't go down like that. So yeah. I got the Bible. I spent some time in it first time through. Uh, and I only read the new Testament because it was the, the old Testament seemed to be way too much back then. And it, mm-hmm. is it, I've, I've ended up finding out that the vast majority of my entrepreneurial lessons have come from the old Testament as it turns out. And I benefited greatly from your podcast series on Exodus, by the way. Um, but at the beginning, I just didn't think I had time for the old Testament. I read through the New Testament and it took me further away from faith because, you know, in it, you know, God, you know, Jesus is talking about, you know, you know, be, before Adam was, I, before Abraham was, I was, I am. And, and I saw Satan fall from heaven. Like, who is this guy? He's got a God complex. As it turns out, for a very good reason, <laughs> he is God. Uh, reading through it a second time, I realized, oh my goodness, you can't make this stuff up. It's true. And, and if it's true, it changes everything. And of course, and it did. Um, I started a business, I, I sold uh, the first business, uh, then started a business with a guy who became my best friend, David Morkin. And it was based on the foundational values of faith first, then family, then work, and then fitness. Mm. Uh, and through a much longer story, God has uh, blessed that. Lots of incredible ups and downs, uh, great faith journey, great journey of working and doing a business as a partner, a great journey of, of making mistakes as I articulated faith and, and successes through God's grace of, of trying to be faithful and obedient. And uh, today, um, Bandwidth and Republic and Relay have done really well. Uh, we took Bandwidth Public. We, we sold Republic to Dish Networks. Uh, Relay continues as a private uh, company. And, and um, through the grace, grace of God has worked uh, really, really well. That afforded me an opportunity with time to, to get involved in some other things. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, we realized, of course, something that all your listeners probably get, and that is that, of course, transformation happens in the marketplace and that it, it happens oftentimes through entrepreneurs. And uh, we had felt real pressures of uh, keeping our faith under wraps as we were raising money early on. By the way, we didn't raise money. We went 0 for 40 in venture raises. Wow. Yeah. And it was that process that taught us a couple of things. One is that, of course, Christian led businesses can compete and win, but two, institutional capital doesn't know what to make of it. Right. And if entrepreneurs can be creative cultural change agents and don't have access to the capital, what does it look like if we're able to pull capital together and to encourage these young men and women of faith? that want to create cultures of loving on their partners, vendors, customers, employees in a way that points to a God being, being about bringing about God's kingdom on earth uh, while bearing witness to the King. What does that look like? And can we be strapped to the mess with these people? And yes, encourage them in mentorship and counseling and things like that, but actually put some capital on and might these companies actually succeed? Yeah. Do they, if they, if they're faithful to their calling and as they set up workplace cultures that are winsome, might they actually have an advantage over others? And I'm not talking about, you know, going ahead and saying, well, because the Holy Spirit, you get a 240 basis point, you know, right. improvement or something like that. But I'm talking about a culture where the leader might talk about why they do what they do in a way that's winsome enough that is able to create this loyalty and employee retention, employee promotion, if you will, mm-hmm. that allows them to flourish. And so that's Sovereign's Capital. Um, five years into it, I'm almost done, but five years into it, we had... Um, we started having our first big problem. And that is that we were saying no to 99 out of a hundred businesses that came to us for financing. Mm. And that's, that's par for the course with most venture capital funds. But you know, we got into this to be an encouragement to faith driven entrepreneurs. And we're saying no that many times you're not being an encouragement. And so, and it, you know, it's wrong stage industry or geography, lots of reasons to not invest in somebody, but there's this time there's a guy named Anatole Melancia who called me up and said, Hey, I hear that you are investing in faith driven entrepreneurs. I am a faith driven entrepreneur. I have a real estate business with some technology in it, but a real estate business in Moldova. And I'd like to talk to you about investing in my business. And I'm like, well, this is going to be easy. We don't want to invest in anything that has anything to do with real estate because I can't even calculate a cap rate. Yeah. And I'm not even really sure that Moldova is a country. <laughs> what I'm thinking it sounds like something out of a fairy tale, right? Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. it does. It does. And uh, so I said, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to invest. And he's, but he wouldn't let me go. Mm. And, and he just like, kind of like virtually like grabbed onto me. He's like, but you have to understand there are not a lot of Christian entrepreneurs in Moldova. I need to know, can I hire a non-believing partner? 
you know, how do I fire people? Well, I mean, will you spend some time with me? And I remember, I remember how I felt. Sometimes you can't remember what you said, but you remember what you felt. Yeah. I remember like, oh my goodness, I definitely don't have time for this. I mean, I remember that. Mm. And so the next week I scheduled a couple hours of Skype and I'm like, I'm going to give, I'm going to dump on you everything I've come to know. And which became the beginning of the, the marks of a fate driven entrepreneur. But uh, I went through, I went through that and then shared some experiences. And, um, and in doing that, I realized that, Hey, there's some things here that were, he said were valuable. They may be valuable for other people. And because I like scale next time I can just point people to a website where we've written these things down and I don't need to spend two hours with a guy like Anatol. And it's just my hubris, my pride, and just, you know, just not making time for the things that God had for me. And yet I think that God has used that because that became the ministry that's become faith driven entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Um, and which is now we've had, you know, thousands of blogs, um, uh, more than 150 podcasts, uh, a conference in this year's conference. We're excited. We've got Tim Keller and, and, uh, Andy Stanley and Donald Miller and Lecrae and Kathy Wood and just Bob Dahl, a bunch of really neat folks. And then um, out of that came a new ministry called Faith Driven Investor, because of course, one of the things that these entrepreneurs need um, is capital. Mm. Uh, a couple of years in a Faith Driven Entrepreneur, we were realizing that as much as people appreciated the fact that we'd send them a link to a podcast, that wasn't really scratching their itch. They were looking for money. Yeah, yeah. And so we created this marketplace and then a ministry to be able to encourage faith driven investors about, you know, you have this opportunity of coming alongside these entrepreneurs and here's how a way to think about doing it in a framework. And so we created a marketplace. And and so uh, a couple other ministries that I'm involved in in the Bay Area, we have something called Generosity Bay Area, mm-hmm. a bunch of people getting together to talk about what does it look like to be generous uh, because of uh, the generosity that, get, that God has shown us. And Gosh, what does it look like if in 10 years from now, everybody in the Bay Area knows a generous Christian? And back to the work of Rodney Stark, you know, looking at the rise of Christianity, Christianity grows when, when Christians are much more generous than the rest of society. So we've got a ministry that does that. And one called Inklings, a bunch of faith-driven entrepreneurs that get together and some other things. That's, I'm married to Kimberly, who is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, and my life partner and just a wonderful woman of God. And we've got three teenage boys, Benjamin, Joe, and Graham, who still live at the house, but Benjamin is about to leave yeah. and we're starting to mourn the loss. Mm-hmm. And that's who that's, that's a, that's a little bit of a sketch yeah, or a lot of a sketch. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. It's a amazing journey, Henry. Thank you for sketching that because it's going to help us. We unpack the, the rest of this. Uh, you've got such a great view as to the different ways that faith-driven people are trying to invest and you're helping them. I mean, you have them all over the map in terms of types of activities mm-hmm. they're going through. And uh, I'd like to get a deeper dive from you on some of those things. You won't be able to cover everything, but I would like to get your definition almost of the major buckets that you see, whether it's real estate, which you didn't used to like, but you like some people who do it now, I know, Uh, whether it's the startups, people who focus on a geography, I know some of your folks have a geographical or continental focus. Uh, What are some of the buckets that you see and the the big categories that are out there? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to answer that Uh, before I do that, just to give a little bit of a framework that'll, that'll help all this to make sense is that uh, I'm overstating here a little bit, but mostly Christ followers have been thinking about investing in the following framework over here in my left hand, I make as much money as I possibly can for my investments. Yeah. And then to the degree that I understand the biblical message of generosity, I try to give away as much as I can on my right hand over here to ministries and missions I care about. Mm. Increasingly the body of Christ is waking up and saying, I might be able to, accomplish the same ministry and missions goals I have over here, yeah. not just through my giving, but through my investments as well, through these different types of buckets that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. And, and yes, it could happen on the patient or the concessionary side. There's lots of opportunities to do that in places like Africa, mm-hmm. but maybe I can also do that on the market return side right. as well. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's been one of the things that we've been looking at. So how does it actually work out? Well, we'll start off with real estate. Yeah. So I still don't know how to calculate a cap rate. Actually, maybe I do now, but um, I don't know much about real estate, but I do know this. I know that real estate is an incredible investment to be able to love on people in a, in a sense of place. Right. I think right. about multifamily real estate. I think about resident chaplaincy. There's uh, ministries like apartment life. 
Yeah. And one of the things I love about apartment life, and this really speaks to the market return side of things. Um, when I got to know Pete Kelly at apartment life, I was taken by the following statistic. And it's that more than 50% of his customers aren't believers. Yeah. These are, these are non-believing people who own real estate, who hire him to come in, they give up an apartment, they pay him a thousand dollars a month to come and to minister to their residents. Now, why do they do it? They do that for pragmatic reasons yeah. of being able to extend and to make it feel like it's home in a community. Yeah. And that means that people don't leave at the end of 12 months. They stay yeah. for two years or three years. Yeah. And it also increases their online reputation. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, ah, that's awesome. That's a ministry. It's done with excellence. Yeah. And so what does it look like that actually by loving on, uh, be, being thoughtful about spiritual integration actually helps you to get a better financial yield mm. as you're able to love people in a way that's winsome and, and, and uh, is able to tell people about Jesus. Mm. Uh, you can do that in, uh, of course, in, in, uh, in, in commercial retail, which is you know shopping centers. And that's where the butcher and the baker and the candlestick maker are. Right. What a great opportunity for, for entrepreneurial workplace chaplaincy. Right. Um, there is, of course, there's co-working aspects. There's, there's ways of being able to bring church into the, into co-working spaces that are a whole bunch of different creative things are done on real estate. So that's real estate. Um, uh, then I'll go to public equities, right? Public equities, um, has probably been around the longest. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, it runs really runs a gamut. Traditionally, it's been thought of as a negative screen. And there's nothing wrong with a negative screen, to be clear. I think that we should all know what we invest in. And so I don't want to invest in things that have to do with um, pornography or gambling, for instance. Right. And yet so many corporations that we invest in through our index funds and other mutual funds actually do that. Yeah. Our capital has influence. Every investment has an impact. Right. You can say, oh, I'm not an impact investor. No, no, no. You're an impact investor. Yeah. You're providing capital to these different. Do you know what they're doing? That's yeah. actually really important. So that negative screen uh, community has been going on for maybe 20 or 25 years. Right. But increasingly, there is a focus now on what does it look like for us to go ahead and invest in human flourishing, particularly in the healthcare side. I love there's a fun family called Eventide that does a particularly good job of this. Mm. And they have particularly good financial returns too. So yeah. Morningstar, Five Star Funds. And Eventide's not the only fun family that's done is doing this with excellence. There's there's a bunch of Praxis Funds and Timothy Funds and Guidestone, et cetera. But um, I love that. And then there's a new thing, Brett, that I'm really excited about, mm. about investment vehicles that invest in companies that are led by Christ followers. Yeah. So yes, we're going to make sure we don't invest in the bad stuff. And yes, we're going to be about human flourishing. But we also understand that there are uh, opportunities to love on our employees through chaplaincy and faith-driven employee resource groups right. that can allow a company to bring, uh, I'm sorry, an employee to bring their whole selves to work. And right. what does it look like to have a fund that does that? So Sovereign's Capital and others are looking at, at, at uh, funds there. So that's public equities. Private equity is my favorite. Yeah, because you're able to invest in entrepreneurs and have these direct investments, mm -hmm. and um, you invest in them at the I, the company formation stage, right? As an entrepreneur is wrestling with their identity mm -hmm. and wrestling with how do I bring my faith in the workplace or not, and how do I do that with gentleness and respect? Um, uh, private equity allows us to go to places that that most other uh, public companies won't go, and Africa and Eastern Europe and other places like that. Um, you know, it, just about every asset class, it can include some level of spiritual integration if we're thoughtful about it. I remember getting a call from a guy who said, hey, I've got an oil and gas uh, opportunity, and I think that we've got a, an opportunity for fund here, and I want to talk to you about investing. And I said, well, I'm sorry, you know, from our family office, we only make investments that have some level of, of gospel proclamation as a part of them. Mm -hmm. and, and to be clear, the movement of faith-driven investing is not doesn't can't be presumptuous or prescriptive yeah it needs to be at its heart about heart posture right. so while kimberly and i feel guided to give to invest in a certain way should not be how other people feel that they need to be guided we need to be guided by getting down on our knees and god how we invest his capital and you know and for somebody they might say i feel that god is calling me to creation care and i'm going to invest in solar farms in the nevada desert Right. Okay, and nobody's going to hear about the gospel in the Nevada desert because it's a bunch of windmills, and that is equally valid, because it's them getting down on their knees and asking God how to deploy the resources He's entrusted them with. Right. Now, as it turns out, with us, we like to give it in a way that has spiritual integration. But I remember this guy calling me up, 
and saying it's oil and gas. I'm like, I thank you, but you know, we really, we need to see, you know, some level of spiritual integration. And uh, it's hard to see that in oil and gas, you know, you know what are you going to do? Evangelize like a, a, a barrel of oil. And then he told me about the ministry to these roughnecks, yeah. thousands of young men that are in the Bakken oil fields in yeah. West Texas mm. and how lonely they are and the spiritual integration opportunity. And I was blown away. Yeah. And I just, I was completely compelled. I had another guy call me up about cryptocurrency and talking about the spiritual integration and cryptocurrency. And that's harder for me to get to. Yeah. But I think that God's at work in all of the capital markets. Right. right. And as it's led by faithful people, it's a big opportunity. But that's a quick overview of, of the buckets. Yeah. No, very interesting. Very interesting. And I like your point about overcoming the old dichotomy. You know, it used to be this, you know, make all you can and then give it over there. I met a guy in South Africa back in 2003. And so I asked him, so if your business was the only vehicle that God had to reach the world, what would you do? And the screensaver went on and he, you know, he blanked out. So I said, okay, forget the world. How about sub-Saharan Africa? And this was down in Cape Town. And by now he's getting smart. And he said, oh, I'd, I'd capitalize the business more and then I'd make more money. And then I'd lay the money at the feet of those who do ministry. I said, it's the, it's the wrong answer. It's a religious mm -hmm. answer, but you have to do the ministry through the business. It's not that giving money is always bad, but that's not how you're going to do it. You have to do the ministry through the business. And so likewise on the investing front, looking at, um, at impact. And, and as you know, capital always carries an agenda. Yeah. It, it's never, and as Christians, I think we've stayed away from that. And we've tried to make capital neutral, which it never is. And uh, I find that right. the Muslims do a better job. They understand that you get leverage out of capital, the leverage to disciple an entrepreneur. And uh, I've spoken with some investors who don't build that into their investing package. But uh, I'm glad that uh, more and more people are saying, yeah, I, I've got something in this and it's not to control you, but it's to bring a positive influence. So I, I love that, that integration. And I also love the fact that you, as you say, it, it could be in any particular, any industry or any uh, focus area that you want to go after. So mm -hmm. let's uh, chat a little bit, Henry, when you look at this, uh, You've seen the gamut of people who are regular Christians who are investors and they just, you know, go about the, the their business as normal, but you know, they're good people, you know, they're wonderful people. And then you've probably seen people who are going after a challenge. They're going after a problem that God cares about. It might be homelessness in San Francisco, or it might be some other, you know, access to electricity or to the internet in Africa, whatever it might be. And, um, and so these are folks going after a particular problem. Uh, as you look at the broad swath of investors, you come across them. And how many of them are going after bringing about a change in society versus getting a return on their investment? Uh, or do you not see that separation? So, um, so that's a great question. What you're suggesting, of course, is that there is an there's a ministry and a missions purpose in solving a problem that every entrepreneur might come up with. And I think that, I think that that's something that Christ followers miss a lot. Um, and I think it comes from an underlying theology. And here's what guides me in this is that every day with my boys, we pray the Lord's prayer, mm -hmm. that God's kingdom will come. And I think that we have an opportunity to bring that about. Now we can see all around us, all of the brokenness and all the things that are not redeemed and not restored and I think that we as entrepreneurs are being used by God to be able to redeem and restore all things, bringing about his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And, and hopefully, of course, faithfully bearing witness to the king. And so at the core of every entrepreneur that's driven by their faith, I think that that's we're drawn by. There's something that's wrong in, in society that's broken. There's... Um, there's just something that's just, just wrong. And it could be something that's just, it's just wrong about what's going on in telecom. You know, I, I don't want to overly spiritualize what the work that we do at bandwidth about helping people to communicate more effectively with people, but it could be just like that, you know, that that's a problem. Yeah. And I, I, I see an opportunity to solve it. Um, but I think that, you know, at sovereigns, we have, I'll give you just a quick, the best example I have is that at sovereigns, we have one screen. Hmm. The screen is, we want um, 
to see men and women that are driven by their desire to honor God in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And it looks different, but each one of them has a desire to build their business to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. We are not an impact fund as most people would look at impact funds. Yeah. Other than I think you make great impact when you're able to, to share the your, your gospel, but we invest in software, service companies, all that. But I would tell you that um, probably 90% of the businesses that we invest in are actually fun, uh, companies that an impact fund would invest in mm -hmm. because they're men and women are serious about their Christian faith and are driven to being able to make a change. So some of them are, uh, are, e uh, are easy to see, but again, we don't have an impact lens. We don't. Yeah. But 90% of the businesses we invest in have some level of just quantifiable societal impact. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. On one hand, on one end of the spectrum, you have Cloud Factory. Sure. Cloud Factory started by Mark Sears, incredible story. It's Sun Microsystems guy he goes to Qatar, ministers to ne Nepali refugees, ends up starting this business that now employs thousands and thousands in Nepal and Kenya. Great gospel witness, an amazing story. 10x return plus, just really, really great. So everybody gets that impact, right? You're providing employment for Ken and Kenya and Nepal. Um, but then you've got a whole group, a much wider group in the portfolio of, of companies like Victor Ho at Five Stars. Victor, you've all been at like coffee shops and in the past you go ahead and you get a punch card. And if you're in the 10th one, now you got a free cup of coffee. And Victor was impressed by the fact, and he came out of, uh, he came out of um, McKinsey and at Harvard Business School studying how to delight your customer and customer retention. Mm. And the problem he saw that was broken in the world was the fact that the coffee shop owner didn't know who their customer was, like didn't know their name mm. or their story. Mm. And so now you've got this whole thing is now just, it's about a transaction. Yeah. And he wanted to bring the humanity back of mm. the way you used to have merchants interacting with customers in small towns. So he created a technology to do loyalty Mm. That is based on you get a five stars number, you put it in. If you haven't been at that merchant to check in for like two months, that merchant can email you and say, Bob, I miss you. Yeah. I know that your favorite cup of coffee is a double latte or something like that. Come in, next one's on us and you bring a friend and 50% off for the friend or something like that. Yeah. So that is thought of, many people will say, well, that's just, you know, it's a, it's a business and it's a business that's thriving. But he was driven because of his faith yeah. to do that. John Beekman at Mancrates. Well, he has an e-commerce company where he goes ahead and he puts these bundled gifts in for men and he, you got to open them up with a crowbar and he's got a lot of publicity and he's done very, very, very well. He started that not because he saw an opportunity in e-commerce, yeah. but because he realized that men were very lousy gift givers. Right. And giving, it being a gift is a transformative experience. He wanted to make that easier. That was his heart passion. Yeah. You look at Anthony Tan, say Anthony Tan, probably maybe the most one of the most successful startups in the world. Mm. They've raised like $20 billion. Mm. He started Grab in Southeast Asia because he saw the problem of people having real safety issues in taxis. Yeah, He's like, there's got to be a better way that lends accountability. He yeah. started Grab all, actually as a ministry, as a not-for-profit first. Yeah, wow. And yeah. so Christ followers worldwide are saying, what's broken Hmm. What would break God's heart? What are the things that need to be fixed? Sure. And then some of the business will say, well, those are just really successful ministries, but at the heart of them, they're all an impact investment as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And that's, I think that answers the question and, uh, and the huge opportunity for entrepreneurs to be uh, change agents. One of our guys in Cape Town, young guy got out of college, got married, he and his wife, seven months drove up through Africa and, you know, just doing the safari thing. But as he went being an entrepreneur, he saw stuff that didn't work. Mm -hmm. And he developed about 22 apps while they were on that trip. He had some developers wow. in India. And oh elsewhere. My goodness. Yeah, just getting through customs is a problem or getting a permit to do something. Just as he went, he just saw problems and he just developed yeah. apps to fix them. <laughs> I mean, it more than paid for the trip, of course. But, yeah. you know, but so, so there's that, that wonderful thing where if you take the cap off entrepreneurs and say, find a problem, as you say, that God cares about, where it intersects with your capability. And, uh, and it's lovely to see sovereigns and others putting capital behind those situations because... I think access to capital has been an issue uh, and capital broadly. So, Henry, when you think about capital, you're thinking about not just financial capital. Uh, do you have a definition of capital or do you just say, well, it's 
intellectual, it's relational, it's political, it's financial, it's social, it's environmental, spiritual. How do you think about capital? Yeah, you know, for a guy that's been, has been running, uh, helping to run Sovereign's Capital for 10 years, you'd think that I'd have, I get a definition of what sovereign is, who the sovereign is, I know that that's God. <laughs> you'd think I'd have a good working definition of the, the second part, which is capital. Yeah. Um, and so you've challenged me on that, but I'll, I'll give you some reflections. Yeah. And that is that, um, of course, we, um, we need to be a steward of our time, talent, and treasure, and that capital is more than just our money. Mm-hmm. Um, but it comes from, of course, this root belief that I have that God owns it all. Yes. He owns me. I've been bought at a price. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My life is not my own. Yeah. My time is not my own. Yeah. My successes are definitely not my own. My money is not my own. God doesn't own 10% or 20%. It is a, you know, Kimberly and I, I had my born again again moment, by the way, at age 38. I became born again at 28. At 38, a friend of mine that you know, Daryl Healed, asked me the simple question, why I gave? Why yeah. do you give? At that point in time, Kimberly and I were probably giving 20%. Yeah. And I thought there's probably a special place in heaven for the double tither. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you get box seats to angels games or something. There's something in it for you. <laughs> But uh, God spoke to me through his word over, over the next six months. And I realized that God only had about 20% of my heart. Yeah, yeah. And so God owns it all. So if God owns it all, our time and all those things, our capital is everything that he's entrusted us with. It's a question of stewardship. And, um, and that's important. So then it's just a question now of, am I faithful and obedient mm. to where God leads me? Yeah. Am I trying to look through every decision through how God would respond mm. versus how I might respond for my convenience mm. or what interests me? And I do that so imperfectly, Brett. Mm. You know, one of the things that I've been wrestling with over the last week is that we had a podcast interview with a guy named Bill Job. Mm. And we're just talking about generosity. We're just yeah. talking about this. And he stopped and he said, he said, is it possible? Or no, he didn't say, is it possible? We're talking about stewardship. We're talking about generosity. And he said, you know, I think it's impossible for a steward to be generous. Mm, mm. I'm like, what? It's like, no, seriously. Look at the definitions of stewardship and generosity. How can you be generous with something that's not yours? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I haven't worked that through completely in my brain. Yeah. And yeah. yet just by the process of working that through helps me to understand the concept of stewardship more. Mm. When somebody comes to me and says, wow, you've been really generous with your time and you're generous with your money. Yeah. I got to be really careful and say, actually, God, was I faithful and obedient Mm. to what God called me to do? Right. Yeah. That's the question. Yeah. Yeah. The the John 5, 19, I think is Jesus says, I only do what I see the father doing now on the investment front, that level of obedience. I think the other thing though, Henry, that I found is that, um, Stewardship can also be a cop-out. Um, and I remember one of my staff telling me, Steward- over-stewardship is another form of greed. And um, what I found mm-hmm. about 20 years ago in Silicon Valley, before you got there and changed the landscape, we'll give you credit for that, <laughs> was that uh, <laughs> people were telling me, you know, Brett, the problem is, is that Christians ask too small. They ask for 5,000, for 10,000, for 20,000, for something that they're working on. Nobody comes with a big vision. If somebody came with a big vision, then the wallets would open up. The funds would open up. People would line up to invest in some big kingdom initiative. And I remember I took a prominent VC for lunch and not for myself, but for somebody else, for another project. I asked him for a million dollars. He nearly choked on his salad, you know. (laughs) And (laughs) what came out was, you know, a letter later, we have these criteria and this and that, and we only give this percent and we do this. And it was an old generation But there's this concept of stewardship, which can become a shield for greed, if you like. Yes. You know, it's interesting you say that. David, my best friend and business partner uh, at Bandwidth, hates the word stewardship. Yeah. Can't stand the word steward. It's like a steward. Steward's not actually making things happen. A steward, that's such a, it's a a non-action thing. He also hates it when I talk about employee retention. It's like employee retention. That's like water retention. That's awful. It's about employee promotion, right? So, um I, I think you're right. I think that there's so many words 
are potentially problematic and stewardship may be one of those. Yeah. I think that we need to be, I think the better words are really, um, are we faithful and obedient? Yeah. Because um, if God presents us with an opportunity and say we have a liquid net worth of $20 million yeah. and there's an opportunity, we hear that God is clearly calling us to be involved in that and yeah. it needs $20 million and we're the ones that give it, then we got to give $20 million. Yeah. And yeah. a steward be like, I'm out of, wait a second, I'm a steward, I'm out of a job now. No, no, you have to work yourself out of a job. And you're right. The steward connotes some sort of like a manager, like I'll go ahead. And we see this a lot with foundations where they just give away 3% of their corpus a year. Right. And they're saying, well, we're trying to be good stewards of it. And because we want to steward this for multiple generations. No, 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 no. That's yeah. potentially really hard, bad thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I love the emerging younger generation who don't have some of that, that baggage, you know, I, I, and, I, and I, I'm encouraged to see that. Uh, a little bit more abandoned when it com comes to plowing capital in, into things. Are you seeing that? That seeing more capital being put to work? Are you seeing the younger generation of kingdom capitalists, if you want to call them that, oh, yes. having, having a, a bit more abandon in this regard? Or are Yes, they yes, yeah. To your reflection before about the older guard being kind of, you know, thrown off by the framework mm -hmm. and, and the ask for a million dollars. Um, so yes, and I'm hopeful. Um, so we started this ministry called Generosity Barrier that I mentioned before. And I've said, I want to focus on the younger generation. Yeah. And the younger generation for two reasons. Mm -hmm. Number one is my sense is that they're more moved by cause and meaning and purpose than an older generation. Yeah. And the second one is that as we're able to encourage people in generosity, it's so much easier to get them when they're younger Mm -hmm. where before they've made, it's hard to ratchet back your life. It's so much easier when you get started to think, what's my, fin yeah. what's my financial finish line? What, yeah. what, what are the, what's my financial plan as we get more money, as we grow older, how are we going to process that and come up with a plan and a discipline ahead of time? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing, of course, is that now you have an opportunity of being able to encourage somebody who's going to be giving for the next 60 years. Right. rather than just giving for the next 15. Yeah. And then if God who took five loaves and two fish and fed 5,000, if that's the case, he doesn't need our money. Yeah. So, because a lot of people say, well, go after the 60, 70 or 80 year old because they'll be able to unleash so much money for the kingdom of God. No, God doesn't need our money. He wants our hearts. Right. And yeah. it's easier to get the heart sometimes of a younger generation. Yeah. Because they're so much more open. Mm -hmm. And so I am encouraged by what I'm seeing in a younger generation of Christ followers. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, my hope is that, um, that that continues. It's harder to work. It's harder to encourage faith-driven investing from an older crew because to some extent they've been doing it differently for so long. Right, right. Yeah, they've had a different framework and so on. Yeah, quite correct. So if you were, I know you've got with your FDI, your Faith-Driven Investor podcast, which I greatly uh, recommend. I think they're wonderful. Thank as you. well as your Faith-Driven Entrepreneur uh, resources, your marketplace. Just yesterday, I referred somebody to your marketplace and I've referred others and uh, and some of them have consummated. Sometimes you have these ideas where you say, well, it's great. You've got the investors over here, but but things don't happen. And uh, about three weeks ago, I got an email from a guy saying, we got our first $100,000 in, in funding, I think it was, and there's more coming in an IT situation outside of Cape Town. So thank you for that. It is actually working. I know it's early stages, but people are finding each other. And so you have the platform that's that's helping with that. If uh, one of the listeners says, look, you know, I don't have a ton of money, uh, but I do want to make a difference through deployment of capital and of my other resources that go with us. I, I might have know-how, I might have connections. You know, in the, we used to talk about smart money versus dumb money. And smart money comes with a lot of other things. And so you bring spiritual capital, you bring networks, you bring connections as well. So for an early stage person, somebody who's saying, yeah, I would like to figure out, you know, just to make my first investment, uh, what would you recommend they do? Um, to get together with their spouse mm. and get down on their knees and ask God, God, help me to understand what it looks like to steward this capital well, to invest this capital well. Yeah. Help me to be faithful and obedient. Mm. Investing, having capital to invest is uh, yet another opportunity that we have to commune with the living God and be in relationship with him mm. and to ask him a decision as we would with anything else. Mm. And we can never miss that. Mm. 
And so, yes, there are some resources on the marketplace for somebody to get involved. Unfortunately, and this is really troubles me to be honest, mm-hmm. is that the uh, right now the marketplace is only approved for accredited investors. Yeah, there are just a number of additional regulatory hoops that you have to jump through to be able to be more Main Street accessible, mm-hmm. and that troubles me because I just told you that I want to be able to be relevant for a younger generation that's trying to figure out how to steward yeah. things. Are they able to um, pool funds in some way? Could you get? Unaccredited investors come together. We're working on it. Absolutely. Yep. And so there are a couple of there are a couple of things that are going on with that. Now, what you will find is that you will find on the Faith Driven Investor website a number of resources that are available outside of the firewall of the individual deals. Mm. Um, we're working with some crowdfunding sites to try to figure out how to go ahead and get get some more access earlier. We're trying to figure out if we go ahead and develop something crowdfunding, I think we'll likely work in partnership with some others early on for those direct angel investments. Yeah, But there are some incredible funds, mutual funds that exist right now. Mm-hmm. You'll find some of those on our uh, website. You'll be able to go through an inventory podcast where we've talked to different fund managers and get some perspective. Yeah. And then just encourage us and push us along as we hear from people that say, you know, we want to get more access to these things. Mm-hmm. And we'd like for you to go ahead and, and, and to think about putting together angel groups as mm-hmm. we hear that, that'll help us uh, encourage us to develop some of those things that are ac- more accessible for all. We have a number of values for the, for the movement. And one of the values mm-hmm. is accessibility for all. Yeah. And we've done, that's the one we've done the worst job on thus far. We need to do a better job. Mm. Henry, speaking on measuring how you've done how has your scorecard changed, your internal scorecard changed over the last you know, 10 years or so in terms of how you measure an investment and how you measure a return on capital? Has there been a shift over time? Yes. It went, th- went from one of some pretty good definition and I knew exactly how he's doing. And that's, gosh, that's comforting. Mm. You know, just getting a scorecard knowing how you're doing to one of, some amount of ambiguity and nuance. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yes. So it's, um, uh, it's complicated. There's a reason why Mark Andreessen uh, said, I'll invest in a house or I'll invest in a boat, which is means I'll invest or I'll give. Yeah. I'm not going to buy a houseboat. Yeah. <laughs> and when, because he was asked about how do you think about concessionary capital and impact yeah. investing? And, um, and now it's, it's um, I need to be able to understand is the entrepreneur going to be able to deliver with excellence? Yeah. And, um, and it's not necessarily financial return. Yeah. And I need to be able to go to God and say, you know, God, what breaks your heart? And if it's job creation and economic development, can I get it? it I, I need to get more information back from the entrepreneur I've invested in beyond the bottom line and the profits. Yeah. Did they employ the people they said they're going to employ? Because yeah. another one of the values we have in the movement is excellence. Yeah. So what is excellence? The best definition I can come up with that on is the entrepreneur, the person who is taking your money and deploying it. Are they doing what they said they were going to do? Yeah. Yeah. So the two things there, number one is you have to have the right framework to say, okay, what am I going to, what's going to look like excellence? And that if that entrepreneur achieves that, Mm -hmm. I will feel like I've made a good investment. And then how do you maintain the relationship with the entrepreneur enough to endeavor to understand some of those sub metrics that you might not have asked before Mm -hmm. from a more black and white investment? Mm -hmm. So Henry, capital is taking you deeper into the mysteries of God. Oh yeah, it is. My life is so much more, God is so more infinite and complex mm. than I knew mm. 10 years ago. And that, 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 that mystery uh, just continues to and it increase. It just makes me go further into God, but also just helps me to just understand how sinful and just inadequate I am mm. Mm. more than I knew five years ago yeah, and just, uh, and just trying to understand what's God at work and what am I doing? You know, one of the things that, that has really impressed me, just spent some time um, in a Bible study through second Chronicles. And in the first part of second Chronicles, you might remember, it's not a great place to be if you're doing a Bible study. It's just the genealogies, right? Mm-hmm. We're doing a chapter a day. So yeah. gosh, what do you make of these genealogies? By the way, it's interesting to see how some of my friends were able to actually get something out of them. I couldn't, but they were amazing. In the second part of second Chronicles though, it talks about the good Kings and the bad Kings of Judah. Right. And I just so, I've been so convicted by the story, the bad Kings, obviously it's, it's like, don't do what the bad Kings do. But I was so convicted by the story of the good kings. Every one of the good kings made a huge mistake. Mm. They didn't seek God yeah. before making an important decision. Yeah. Yeah. And it was one of them was a trade deal. A bunch of them, of course, was going off in the war, mm. and it didn't go well for them. Mm. 
And I think that every investment decision we have, am I really seeking God? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. There's due diligence in scripture. <laughs> That's there for is. sure. Yeah. And, and with a different set of criteria. So I love that, Henry. I love that part of your journey where you've got from, you know, you could from, you know, for me, one of the differences between the kingdom of God is uh, it operates by revelation and the kingdom of this world operates by calculation. And mm. so, you know, you, you have to approach this whole thing of kingdom investing with ears and heart and eyes open for revelation from God. And as you say, yeah. the willingness to obey, because the answer is to do what he tells you to do, regardless of how it turns out. And trust him that on, a, on an overall portfolio, at the end of the day, he's going to be pleased. So, um, Henry, I know you have to go. So we greatly appreciate your time. But I'm going to do what you do to people on your podcasts. You know how yes. you your podcast. You say to people, Henry, what is God talking to you about at the moment? And I think you might have just alluded to that. But is there any one last thing that God's speaking to you about at the moment that you'd like to just share? Yeah, so um, you're right. The Second Chronicles story is, is is super impactful for me. But uh, what God is teaching me right now through His Word is actually something that uh, is actually a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, he's taking me into Psalms. Yeah, and um, and I'm going through Psalms. One of my one of my uh, one of my boys is going through a really particularly difficult time, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been trying to go through Psalms with him. And going through Psalms myself, you know, there's an old maxim that you're only as happy as your un as your unhappiest child. Perfect. And God calls us to do to, to something different and greater than that, to be clear. And yet we all know how that kind of feels. And so as my son has been going through some, some challenges and just um, and some depression, um, uh, I've been looking back at Psalms too. And it's just amazing. A couple of things on one on, on the Psalms is. Um, just the amplitude of the ways, I mean, you know, you know, you got David, it's just in you know, Psalm six, he's just in tears and just awful. It just, you know, and, um, and then, and then he's elated and he's in tears and he's elated. He's singing and dancing and praising God. And then he's just, oh my goodness, it's awful. And uh, another passage on that, but I love that because mm. that's the way that life is. David, the greatest leader of all time yeah. lays his, his leadership journal is kind of in Psalms. It's at least his, prayer journal yeah yeah it's amazing stuff but there's a, another one too um uh that i think is helpful for people who are going through a difficult time which is came from a uh an interview i did recently with a guy named chris hodges which helped me to understand first kings 18 and 19 in a way that just had never been opened up to me before where you have elijah who's on top of the world i mean he just took the the, the prophets of babel and just taunted them and just you know, kind of in your face type of thing. Yeah. And he's elated and just in the power of God. Now he's running in front of chariots. I mean, I don't know how fast that is, but yeah. faster than I can run. That's for sure. And then just a couple sentences later at the beginning of first Kings 19, he's crawling under a bush yeah. and wants to die. Yeah. Yeah. What's up with that? I mean, it just Jezebel threatened him a little bit. I mean, yeah. right. Right. I mean, so, and, uh, and that's, you know, and, 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 and then the angel came down and ministered to Elijah in a beautiful way. Yeah. And just how God works in our strengths, but especially in our weaknesses and how that is all part of God's plan and how it's laid out in scripture. So um, I'm encouraged during this time where I've been uh, really challenged and sad for my son mm -hmm. and sad myself mm -hmm. about the countless stories of, um, of the same type of thing happening in scripture and how God ministers to us in the midst of that. You know, you don't need it. And then of course, Psalm 23 is not the end of Psalms as we all know, but it just encapsulated it so brilliantly and beautifully. Mm -hmm. And then Psalm one, go back to Psalm one. I just, may we all, may I, you and all of your listeners plant our tree, uh, plant our trees by streams of living water. Yeah. And yeah. the promise that comes from that mm -hmm. is just, you know, you don't bear your fruit in every season. Right. You know, sometimes you don't have your fruit and now revelation. Interestingly, it talks about the new Jerusalem. You know, those are trees that bear fruit every month. Yeah. 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 Right. But in Psalm one, it's, you don't bear fruit in every season, but your leaves are always green. Yeah. Right. So you never completely despondent. Yeah. So uh, God's preaching to me, teaching me through Psalms. Mm. Thanks for asking. You're welcome. Henry, thank you so much for joining us. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your faithfulness and your obedience in your journey. 
And uh, other than you moving to Silicon Valley when California is moving to Tennessee and Texas, I mean, other than that, it all looks great. <laughs> well, well, thank you. Yeah. Well, um, uh, I, I got to tell you, it's um, it's a great it's a great honor to be on your podcast. It's funny for you to tell me. Thank you for your wisdom. When I'm uh, when I've gotten so much from you and your teaching, and I just want to the content you come up with, the one that made that particular impression on me, of course, is that Exodus study. Mm -hmm. So it's funny for me to hear somebody of your, uh, of, of your faithfulness and your obedience, your leadership for so long, thanking me for my wisdom, which is funny. Uh, so thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your wisdom. It's been a great treat to be with you guys. Thank you. Mm -hmm.